Hi there, and welcome to another installment of Fragments of Infinity, What They Didn't Teach You in Music School. And uh, today, we're going to explore the strange and confounding circle of fifths. And my experience to a uh, musical layman, when uh, people speak about the uh, circle of fifths, um, from their perspective, they usually consider it this esoteric, mysterious thing that you know, some kind of math that they'll never get. When in fact, just like everything else in music, everything is built on simple building blocks. Um, from those building blocks, you can create infinite complexity, and that's the beautiful thing, and that's why fragments of infinity, we have these fragments that infinity brings forth, and when you combine some of these fragments together, you're creating another infinite phenomenon, such as the phenomenon of music. When you think about it, a note is a finite uh, entity, a finite individual entity. A chord is a finite individual entity. Well, it's not individual in that case, it's three, and there, you know, there's more complexity there. But point being that when, when you think about it, I mean, if you go back to the time of Bach till the time of now when uh, temperament was employed in our musical system, think of all of the music, the amazing, ridiculous, endless music that have come out of 12 tones. How is that even possible? But yet, these fragments created an infinity of possibilities. And we're not done yet, you know, um, uh, there's still more music to make and there's still more ways of making music that we haven't yet discovered and that's really what excites me and makes me want to uh, look forward to the future. So today we shall talk about the circle of fifths and also the enharmonic phenomenon. That's a nice fancy word, enharmonic, and if you want, I always tell my students, you know, when I throw out a term like that, I say, you know, bring it up in conversation. Watch your friends be impressed at what a scholar you are. So uh, I'm going to explain, it's necessary to explain what the term enharmonic means. And uh, I always bring it up when I discuss the circle of fifths, although it does relate to a lot of other uh, stuff. So before we begin, make sure that you've watched... Um, the previous video I, I put up called uh, the whole step, half step formula and three easy steps to creating a key. Those are essential for you to understand this next step. Okay, so I use this fancy term enharmonic, so what does it mean? Um, enharmonic, different names, different names for the same pitch, chord, key or scale. That's right, even there are enharmonic keys. Now, if you see right above here, I have the chromatic series listed, and the way I listed it, and this is just a personal preference, I don't even know why, I, I tend to default to flats, which is odd because guitar is more of a, a sharp, friendly key, but um, there's something about flats, I kind of like, I don't know what it is, but anyway, so we have uh, C, D flat, D, E flat, E, F, G flat, G, A flat, A, B flat, B. And notice between E and F, and, well, we don't have the, the octave C up here, but if we did, uh, E and F and B and C don't have a note in between. Those are the half steps that arise from, uh, that we find in the key of C, okay? It's just, just think of it as names like Harvey, Bill, and Bob, or I don't worry about it, or Sally and Jane, I don't want to be sexist here. So, yeah, just um, just uh, think of these these note names. It's very very abstracted. So just think of them as labels for a musical phenomenon. Keep it in that abstract sphere because otherwise you might get confused, like you know, what what all these symbols mean. So now you'll notice that this is the twelve notes of our chromatic series. But dropping down these arrows, you notice I have D sharp, uh, C sharp, D sharp, F sharp, G sharp, and A sharp, which are the same note, like C sharp is the same note as D flat, right? Uh, e flat is the same note as D sharp. One musical phenomenon, two different names, sound exactly the same. There is no difference. 
Uh, there was a time before pre-temperament where um, two notes with with a different name, like say uh, E flat and D sharp, would actually sound the same. That's a very strange thing. And there's also we have a seven-letter musical alphabet, but apparently in the time of Bach, there was an eighth note called H. And I, I kid you not, you can look this up on the internet. I don't even know exactly what that note was or what it stands for. But remember, they were tweaking temperament at the time, so maybe this was a, a, a note that stood out that was slightly different uh, than the other seven. And by the way, just a little parenthetical side note, Mr. Bach himself wrote a piece based on the letters of his name B-A-C-H. Because, again, the H was a note a long time ago. And thank God it isn't now, because it's not the more the merrier in this case. It's the more the more complex. So I'm glad we just have uh, the names we have, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. All right, so we looked at the phenomenon of a note being sounded the same but having more than one name. And uh, by the way, there's even... Um, really extreme and harmonic tones. For example, if I sharp C and then sharp it again, that would be called C double sharp. And that, believe it or not, exists. I'm going to tell you about it later. It's really, <laughs> it's really weird. But in any case, uh, yeah, C double sharp is the same as D. And think about it. You know, C is a whole step away from D. So you take it up one half step, which would sharp it, and then another half step and sharps it more. Well, it becomes the same note as D. So that's another example of enharmonic uh, notes that are the same note, different names. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, let's uh, talk about um, chords. Now, when we get into the deeper stuff, the harmony stuff, I'll explain all this, but I'll give you an example like um, uh, A minor 6 is the same chord sounds exactly the same as F sharp minor 7 flat 5. The only difference being that the bass note in that chord changes. And F sharp minor 7 flat 5 is also called F sharp half diminished. Now the half diminished is a classical term and it's one of those classical terms that are useless. And why I say useless, if I say F sharp minor 7 flat 5, right? I know that I have an F sharp minor 7 chord and I need to take the fifth of that chord and flat it. Well, what does half diminished say? It doesn't tell you the function of the chord. That's one of the things that kind of pisses me off about classical theory. They, they almost purposely put these esoteric names onto things and you don't know what the hell they, they are. This is why I'd say if you really want to study music theory, in the beginning avoid classical music theory. Study jazz theory. It's much, much closer to the system I'm describing although that needs some corrections. Uh, the jazz system needs corrections too, but at least the jazz system tells you what's what. And that's what I appreciate about jazz uh, chord naming, is that I know what's going on when I hear the name of a chord. I, could, I, I won't go into the story, but I once asked, I was working at Austin Guitar School, I once asked uh, the classical guitar teacher, I said, you know, I, I heard of this Neapolitan sixth. Can you tell me what exactly that is, and he, he, he told me about it, and I said, oh, that's like in jazz, it's a tritone substitution. Now, a tritone substitution tells you two things. It tells you it's a tritone away from the chord, and it's substituting for that chord. What does a Neapolitan six tell you, right? It's from Naples, you know? It doesn't say much. And you don't even know if it's a, well, I won't go into that, if it's a major six chord or if it's based on the sixth step of the scale. So there you go with that. I, you know, I do prefer jazz naming. Uh, so there's another example, uh, two, uh, a co one chord, three different names. And this happens uh, more often than you think. Um, all right, now, uh, scales. We have what's called the relative minor scale, the Aeolian scale, and uh, the natural minor scale. Three different names, same exact scale. All right, now the real confounding one is keys that have the same name, uh, different name, but sound exactly alike, that are, for all intents and pur purposes, sonically, they are the same. All right, so that's what enharmonic is. And with that preface, now we could go a little bit uh, further into the idea of the circle of fifths. So now... Having watched, I'm assuming, having watched uh, the whole step, half step formula video and how to create a key in three steps, 
if you were to go about the exercise of uh, creating keys from all 12 of, our, 12 of our notes of the chromatic series, all right, you'd get C has zero sharps or flats, that's our basis key. D flat has five flats. Um, D has two sharps. E flat has three flats. E has four sharps. F has one flat and so on and so forth. You notice there's almost no, there is a bit of a pattern to this, but you'd have to figure it out. Um, what the circle of fifth does, and this is why, I don't know why they place so much importance on this, this circle of fifths. It's, a, it's basically just a way of taking this, these 12 keys and putting them in a different kind of order. Now, what is that order? Well, if we did all 12 keys, you would start to notice things like, uh, Key of F here. Key of F has one flat. Key of B flat has two flats. Key of E flat has three flats. Key of A flat has four flats. So it's an increasing order of amount of flats on that side of the circle fifths. And then with the sharp keys, uh, we have G has one sharp, D has two, A has three, E has four, so on and so forth. Now mind you, all of these 12 keys are the same phenomenon starting at a different pitch, one of the 12 pitches we have. So one will sound like do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. One will sound like do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. It's just the same thing. One of the analogies I give is if you learned a tap dance routine and you did that tap dance routine really well and you do the same steps every time for the tap dance routine, if you're on a stairwell, if you're at the fifth step, you're doing the same tap dance as if you would have done on the first step or the eighth step or the ninth step. Same tap dance, different level. Okay, that's what the keys are. So the circle of fifth basically is a compilation of these keys uh, represented on a circle. And let me get my circle of fifths. Here, I'm sure if you studied any music at all, you've seen this a gazillion times. This here is the infamous circle of fifths. And uh, you'll see that on the uh, right side, from my perspective, we have the sharp keys. And so we start with C, and then we go to G, which has one sharp. Uh, D which has two sharps, A has three, E has four, B has five, and note here, F sharp has uh, six sharps. But notice the parentheses and notice its enharmonic name, G flat. Okay, so if I were to play the F sharp scale or the G flat scale, they both are exactly the same, just different notations for all of them. Now, of course, same goes for flats. We F has uh, C has no flats. F has one flat, B flat has two, E flat has three, blah, blah, blah. Now, let's talk about what I call hypothetical keys. Um, in some depictions of this, in fact, quite a few, you're looking at the sharp keys, they keep going uh, up a few more steps. For example, they'll list a key of C sharp, which uh, does exist. C sharp is the same note as D flat. Yes, you can have a key of C sharp. But what you've done is just, you notice how the sharps increase. So here we have six sharps. Wait a second, we're going to have seven sharps in the key of C sharp. All seven notes have a sharp on them. That's almost easy because if you know the key of C, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, you know C sharp. C sharp, D sharp, E sharp, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, B sharp, right? So that. But as you go along further, what I'm going to do is demonstrate, well, what about this key of E flat? What if I made that the key of D sharp? How would you like to read some music and have nine sharps in your key signature? Well, that's what you're going to get, folks. All right. So uh, let me show you here. First of all, I have the three steps to creating a key. First, I listed in the way I described the key of D sharp. But what I did, and I said when there's a sharp or a flat in the name, what you do is um, you call that sharp, and then just write out the rest of the alphabet. Don't think sharps or flats, just write out the rest of the alphabet. Now, on the second step, we place the whole step, half step formula underneath. And on the third step, we have made the scale conform to the whole step, half step. Now, dig this. D sharp to E sharp, well, they're asking for a whole step. 
Well, D to E is a whole step, so it only stands to reason that D sharp to E sharp would be a whole step. They're moving in parallel. But when we go E sharp to F, notice double sharp. Why? Because they want a whole step. Now, let's think of this. It's a little abstract, but let's think of it. E sharp, since it's a half step from F, is the same as the F note, right? So now they're asking for a whole step from what is ostensibly an F note. So how can I turn an F into a G? You see what I'm saying? Um, if E sharp is F, sonically, again, we're talking about anharmonic notes. If E sharp is F, then we have to go a half step up from that E sharp, which is F. A whole, uh, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, a half step up from that E sharp, which is F. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is a whole step. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so, E sharp is equivalent to F, and then we have F double sharp here. Why? Because if E sharp is this note F, I have to go up two half steps to get a whole step from F, which is the same as E sharp. So, this is called a double sharp. It's absurd, okay? Um, the way I describe, especially guitar, but all, all the instruments really, is that they rely a lot on visualization. And I always tell my students, the more theoretical words you have when you're playing, the more you're going to screw up and, and kind of put um, roadblocks into your soloing. Because um, the thinking function should only say, go here, go there, go here, go there. That's all you're doing when you're improvising. That's all that should happen. When you start thinking, okay, well, let me see, I need a whole step from F, but I'm in the key of D sharp, so F double sharp would be equivalent to G, blah, 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 blah. By the time all that thought has occurred, the song is already over. So, uh, uh, so then we have F sharp double sharp now, which is equivalent to G, the same as G, and then we have G sharp. Well, they're asking for a half step, we got it. G sharp to A sharp, well, G to A is a whole step, it only stands to reason G sharp to A sharp. And then A to B is a whole step, so A sharp to B sharp will be a whole step. All right, so B sharp is equal to a C note. Because why? Because B to C is a half step. When I sharp a B, it becomes a C. So C has to become a D for it to be a half step below D sharp. So you have to double sharp the C. C double sharp is, for all intents and purposes, a D note. Again, and harmonically. So there you go to D sharp. Now you see what a mess that is logically. Maybe I even confounded you with all this. Well, yeah, it's 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 unwieldy and ridiculous. If we were to compare that to the sweet key of E flat, we discover we have only three flats to look at in this, rather than nine sharps. Okay, so you see the difference. This is much more ergonomic. So when you go around the circle of fifths. I say the buck stops here. There is one enharmonic key that I like to represent, and it's necessary to re represent that one. Now, next thing we're going to talk about regarding the circle of fifths is, is the concept of neighboring keys. Now, you might think in the chromatic series, D flat is right next door to C. So you might think to yourself, that's a neighboring key. It's close by. But let's use an analogy. Let's say you have some neighbors next door, and they're complete idiots, and they're noisemakers, and they're troublesome, and they're white trashy or whatever. These people are, are your neighbors, but there's not a close relationship between you and your neighbors. Go five houses down, and you find out, wow, those guys like tennis, and so do I. And wow, those guys uh, like to cook Italian food, and so do I. I love Italian food. There's a relationship there, five houses away. All right, so the same with music. When I go from C to D flat, I get five flats, all right? That's very distant. But if I go C to G, I have one sharp. Now think about this. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, that's the key of C. And then G, A, B, C, uh, G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G. 
Now, I'm going to recite both of those, but for the, G, uh, for the G scale, I'm going to start on the C note so you can see the similarity. C, D, E, F, G, A, B. C, D, E, F sharp, G, A, B. So we have one note difference, six notes in common. These are neighbors. C and G are neighbors, and the same is true for the key of F. So when we talk about modulating, that is going to different keys, um, uh, it's very, very easy to modulate to the key of G or F. All right. So that's, uh, that's basically it on the circle of fifths. Um, there are some people that actually, uh, to me it's just a theoretical model, it's a way of making a list is all it is. It's a laundry list to me. But there is a book called either Chord Alchemy or Guitar Alchemy where uh, the dude sets about uh, to, uh, to like, go through the circle of fifths and you could find ways like making, making um, patterns inside the circle, like a triangle shape, whatever, uh, to get chord progressions. To me, the system I'm going to teach you is a hell of a lot easier to find chord progressions. When I looked at his book, my eyes kind of went, I, I got cross-eyed. So anyway, that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed the lecture, and thanks so much for tuning in. You guys are awesome. Thank you.